Um, hello, my name is Jean-Louis. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, using JavaScript in production. Uh, so let's find out. Um, what I'm going to tell you is our journey uh, from Rails to JavaScript. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about who we are and what we tried to achieve when we got started. Uh, and I would like to also talk about how it was like to introduce, introduce ClojureScript in our company. Uh, and at the end, I will just go through the takeaways from this experience. Um, I'd like to mention that this journey was not particularly epic. There were like no battles or fights or great victories. Um, it was more of a mindful walk um, with many small steps we took, uh, always trying to be aware of ourselves and our pain points. Um, and it was full of many small surprises and happiness. Uh, I would say I'm extremely happy, both being here today, but also with the whole journey. So I hope I can convey some of those feelings today during this presentation. I won't have time to cover uh, everything uh, I wanted to say, but this uh, talk is extremely meta. So, of course, you can see that the slides are implementation, are a demonstration of how we write our closure script code in production. So if you're curious about some things, you can look them up. Uh, I just made this repository open source right now, so you can look it up on GitHub. I have a ton of cool meta slides that are implemented in themselves, so you can look it up. Who we are? Um, Zimpler, we're a small Swedish company founded in uh, 2012. Um, we're fairly small, 27 employees at this point, seven developers and two designers. And we build a mobile payment solution. Um, I'm going to show you quickly how it looks like today. Um, the way our system works is that um, merchants will include our solution on their web page. And when the user wants to make a payment, they will go through our checkout. If the demo gods are with me. Oh, yes. So this, is, this square here is our checkout. Um, that's how it looks like today, returning closure script. Uh, so the user would put in their phone number, and they receive an SMS on their mobile that they input. And then they get to choose uh, between paying by bill or by card. And if you choose by bill, you will confirm your personal information and you will receive an invoice from your bank. So here, this success box here would be the merchant's own success implementation. Like it's outside of a control after that. So that's just to give you an idea of the product we've, we built using ClojureScript. Um, to give you an idea of the scale of our project as well, um, as I mentioned earlier, with seven developers and two designers. Uh, we're available in two countries, Sweden and Finland, and also across three locales. So that's one aspect uh, you have to consider. We have about 7,000 active users and uh, about 60,000 euros worth of uh, payments every day. So it's not Google, but you know, it's honest numbers here. Um, and you see that about 10% of our code today is ClojureScript. The rest is Ruby on Rails. Uh, fun fact, uh, we have about as much CSS code as we have ClojureScript code today. So just shoot out to the designers out there. You're very important. So the beginning of our journey, that was uh, 18 months ago. We had three Ruby on Rails apps in production. Uh, one of them was our uh, old checkout. Uh, so we already had a checkout running in production at the time. Um, spoilers, that's where we introduced the closure scripts later on. Um, and at that time, we just hired our first uh, full-time designer uh, at the company. And we were planning to add a lot of new features to our checkout, uh, in particular, new payment methods, which would require massive changes and a lot more branching in our checkout flow. The thing is, we were not happy with the status quo, with keeping doing stuff the way we did in Rails. Um, part of the reason was that we had a lot of braided flow state and view logic, which is a bit intrinsic to the idiomatic way of doing things in Rails. 
uh, it was a particularly painful for this application because our checkout is very much a step through wizard kind of thing, which is not very easy to implement in out of the box with Rails. On top of that, we started to have very slow running tests, uh, about 10 minutes to run the whole test suite. And developers ended up being the bottleneck to any change to the checkout. In particular, if designers wanted to get in and make a small visual change, uh, developers would have to come in and help with uh, the template language we were using. So we set out at the beginning of our journey with a goal um, to get a new, more flexible solution uh, that can handle all the upcoming features we wanted to implement, while at the same time addressing some of the pain points we had earlier. Uh, given that we're a payment solution like we were, we had a few constraints to begin with, so we were aiming for high availability. Uh, we're a service that's consumed by third parties, and downtime on our side will affect all our customers and their customers. Um, on top of that, we really wanted to choose a solution with an acceptable barrier of entry, both for designers and developers. Um, so if we choose a new technology, it would have to be accessible from the beginning. Uh, why we wanted to get that is because we were planning to hire more people, and it was important for us that they, did, they don't get overwhelmed by our code or our architecture, and we were hoping for them to be able to hit the ground running. We were also focusing very much on keeping a simple development environment. When we, you use Rails, you got a very simple setup. You do Rails new and you got everything in place and you don't have to worry about the infrastructure of your development machine. So we wanted to keep that. And on top of that, uh, iterating faster is really important for us. We try to keep uh, being agile, even after four years as a startup. So for us, it was extremely critical to get fast and simple deploys as well. So what was our plan? Um, we already had a Rails app, so we thought, let's just break out all the view and flow logic out of the backend and into a single page application that would run in the browser. And we would just turn the existing Rails application into a pure JSON REST API. So visually, this is how it looks like. At the top, this was our, our existing application, where all the logic was basically in the backend. And then the server just sent uh, ready-made HTML to the browser directly. So it was not very interactive. We couldn't run that much things in the browser. And what we were planning to do is move the flow and view logic into the browser so we could do some inline validations, for instance and then talk to the backend, backend using a JSON REST API. So spoiler, for the single page application, we chose to use it uh, to use uh, Clojure Script. So why Clojure Script? Well, to be truly honest, we had a bias to begin with. Uh, we had two developers that were interested in Clojure. Um, and there were a lot of uncertainties at the time. That was one and a half years ago but we believed that Clojure Script would be a good fit for us and our goals. We considered many options, and we acknowledge that there's probably many more good alternatives uh, to, this, so to this kind of problem, uh, but we really wanted to explore this uh, track as an option. Um, so once we had this kind of feeling that Clojure Script would be a good fit, we tried to sell it to our colleagues. And I think the strongest selling point is compared to JavaScript, Clojure Script provides simply much better semantics. Um, if you know JavaScript, equality, truthiness, and scoping are complex things in JavaScript. Uh, and that out of the box is much better with Clojure Script. Clojure Script also provides just namespacing. Uh, if you worked with a big enough code base, you know that namespacing and modularity are extremely important. Uh, and it's not a thing you get out of the box from JavaScript. You get dead code elimination and a big standard library, all thanks to the Google Clojure compiler. Uh, so that was also like battery included from the very beginning. On top of that, it was a fairly safe bet uh, since uh, Clojure Script offers uh, seamless JavaScript inter interop. So you could use any existing JavaScript library from Clojure Script. 
which felt like, okay, in the worst case, we have an escape hatch by using just existing JavaScript library or even writing some code in JavaScript if we need to. And one really useful thing with ClojureScript is just static name resolution. If you can, at compile time, find out if a, if a variable is defined or not, uh, that's like, if you, if you felt that uh, power, it's very hard to go away from it. You'll notice that functional programming, per se, was neither a selling point nor a hurdle for us. Um, first of all, we were fairly familiar with functional programming concepts, uh, as we were reading, writing Ruby code in a fairly functional way already. But it didn't really enter into consideration when we sold the ID to our colleagues. Um, and finally, we ran a two-week uh, experiment showcasing how we could build the Clojure Script app. And at the end of it, we held the presentation and code walk through so that all our colleagues could understand our motivation and uh, see what kind of power we can get with Clojure Script. So after we sold the idea of trying Clojure Script, we started with phase one. I wanted to put some kind of Avenger quote, but I didn't have time, so never mind. Um, so the first phase was we took a few steps and many small steps toward going to production. And the first step is, of course, building a prototype. The way we did it is our designer, uh, newly hired, uh, started to work on a pure HTML and CSS mockup, completely static. They didn't wait for us developers to set up any particular infrastructure for them. They just hit the ground running with their own familiar tools to develop HTML and CSS. In parallel, um, developers worked on the core functionality of the application, that is setting up the basic infrastructure for API calls, deploy scripts, and tests. Um, and also, our application needs a lot of state management um, because of all the HKCs we have with the payment solutions. Um, so this, this back end of the front end of, uh, I, I like to call it that, nobody likes it, but I like it. The back end of the front end could be developed separately from the actual rendering logic, which was pretty neat. And the way we did it was the whole state of the application was contained in a single atom. And the view ended up being just a pure function of that state. So we were working like that on two parallel tracks, tracks, and in the end, we just came together using a library called nFocus. And nFocus is something that can take pure HTML as template and add dynamic content to it. So that was a very powerful thing that from the very beginning, we were able to work in parallel and come together and not waste any cycles in our prototyping. So here is how the code looked, at, looked like. At the top is a pure HTML file that the designers were able to write on their own. And at the bottom is the ClojureScript code that adds dynamic content to it. Uh, this whole slide is, of course, oh, come on, yeah, live reloadable. Um, so that, the thing that I just demonstrated is, of course, because we introduced FigWheel as a library. So every time you save a file, the Clojure script will be recompiled and uploaded into the browser. So you get a very interactive experience. And the nice thing about Thingwheel, and David mentioned that earlier in his talk, that you don't need any special tool for that. You can use your own editor. You just change your Clojure script code and it will compile and you can see the change immediately. We took the same approach for running tests. There is this cool library called uh, lane do. Uh, and it does the same thing. It will watch for file changes, recompile your Clojure script, and run the test automatically for you in the background. Again, no special integration for running your test. Extremely nice. Um, besides those two tools, we used also a um, tool that was brought in by our, our uh, designers which is Browser Sync, and it's a purely JavaScript tooling library that uh, provides a server that will do automatic page reload when some of your file changes. Uh, the nice thing there is that designers could do their work without having to care at all about 
chloroscript, like our weird UFO in the backyard. They don't have to look at this. Um, I think, so the takeaway from this is that if you can show a super short, super crisp feedback loop without any special tooling, it, it made us super happy and productive from the very beginning, very early on. Sadly, not everything was rose and pinky because once we started to test this application on small device, it uh, turned out that manipulating the DOM directly was super slow. Uh, but we really liked the way we wrote the application, having the whole state in one place and then deriving the view from that state. So we were wondering, can we keep that logic but just speed up the rendering? And at that time, there was this cool library called React. Um, it seemed to address exactly this issue. Uh, we were a bit worried because it seemed to be pretty big. Uh, so we didn't want to introduce it too early. But since we felt that, okay, this is starting to get a pain point and we do not want to optimize our rendering, rendering logic, uh, maybe React could be a good fit for us. So we looked at our options and we settled for a library called Regent. And that's a closure script library that wraps React into uh, idiomatic closure basically. Um, and another nice thing is that this, there is this other um, library called Kiyu that basically does exactly what Enfocus did with us by adding the, uh, dynamic content to HTML. But what it did is it took raw HTML and compiled it into regent data structures. So this is how it looks like. At the top, it's the same HTML as before. But at the bottom, it's almost the same code, except this one compiles down to React data structures, which is pretty powerful. Nice thing is that we introduced React completely painlessly and in a manner that was transparent to the designers, actually, because they were able to keep working with the same old boring HTML and CSS. I say boring just as a reference from the earlier. I'm not saying it's bad, it's good. So we had a working application that's fast enough uh, and the basic features we needed. So we were ready for phase two, which is going to production. Before we could go live, there was a bunch of boring things we had to take care of. First of all, given we were available in two countries and with three locales, we have to take care of localization from the very beginning. The solution we used is this collaborative tool called Phrase App. Uh, which means that anybody can go in and change the text and then you just have to pull the change in your application and that's it. Um, we use it together with a library called Tower. You can just look it up, but it provides localization features for ClojureScript, Clojure and ClojureScript. Something we didn't, didn't think about from the very beginning is cache busting. So if you do front-end development, you know that cache invalidation is an issue. Oh, surprise. The way to solve that is to rename all your, your assets with a URL that contains uh, MD5 of their contents, so that when you fetch a URL, it's always uniquely as, um, linked with a specific version of your assets. Not something I was thinking about when I got started, but it's a problem we had to solve before going live. We also, of course, had to implement some kind of deploy scripts, which we use Ansible for. It's details, but good to know there's ways to do things. Also, there was taking care of SSL certificates. We solved that using CloudFront, so we didn't have to deal with too many things. Uh, we used Honey Badger for error logging, so that was pretty nice. When we get an exception in the front-end application, we just upload it to a third party so we can look at it afterward. Uh, spoiler, since the whole state in a single atom, you can upload it to your error logger and you can very quickly, quickly debug what went wrong. Of course, we had to add the usual continuous integration tool. So we use Travis for that, which means every time we push our code to our GitHub repository, the test will be run automatically. And we went, made sure to run a full battery of cross-browser testing using Source Labs. So after we took care of all those details, we actually went live uh, with a minimum viable product. 
Uh, it took us uh, three months to get there, from the first commit to actually going live. And from there on, we were able to focus on adding new features. Sadly, who knows, we got some random errors in production on the iPhone 4. Uh, quickly looking at the error, it appears to be something to do with hash lookup logic. Uh, sadly, it took us a whole week of debugging to figure out what it was. And the crazy thing is, it has nothing to do with our code. It has nothing to do with JavaScript. It has to do with uh, the way the JIT compiler is broken on certain hardware of the iPhone. Uh, and annoying thing with JIT compiler bugs is that when you use the Safari inspector, it turns off the JIT compiler. So it's kind of a nightmare to debug. Anyway, we did a workaround in our project. Um, you can wrap pieces of code in a try catch, and it will dis disable the JIT compiler for that piece of code. Uh, fun fact. Um, so that's how we solved it. And just to be fair, like this was our biggest time sink, uh, the, the biggest problem we had. We spent a whole week debugging. It was not our fault. It was not ClojureScript's fault. It was some hardware problem. But still, I mean, if it happens to you, come to me. We have a workaround with TryCatch. Um, OK, and we had this setup, and it was nice and everything. But our designers were not extremely happy with their own tooling. Um, basically, we just patched things together using make files and a bit of scripts here and there. So by the designer's request, we introduced a new tool called Gulp. And Gulp is a JavaScript build tool and task runner for JavaScript. It's like, kind of like Leningen, but for Node.js. Um, the cool thing with Gulp, in our case, is that it helped us integrating with a ton of extra JavaScript tooling that's not necessarily available from within ClojureScript. Um, we used it to compile the SAS into CSS, if you're familiar with this thing, or even just minify CSS. And we use it to do the cache busting of our assets. Also, it's nice because it can run uh, tasks in parallel very easily. So we were able to add a bunch of quick hacks to our workflow using that. Also, in our experience, and I'm talking about a, a year ago, um, ClojureScript and Leningen have not been super great at handling non-ClojureScript tooling. For instance, SAS compilation using Leningen was fairly slow, and also it took quite a lot of time to boot. Uh, so I'm, take, I'm talking about a few seconds, of course, but it was frustrating to our designers. They're, they're used to using tools that are sub-second from, from the very beginning. Like, you have a SAS file, you want to compile it. You don't want to wait 10 seconds for it. And also, the SAS compiler kind of crashed every now and then when we were using ClojureScript. So in the end, using Gulp instead of doing everything in ClojureScript uh, helped us a lot, at least for the approval of our designers. And then, of course, we added a bunch of other cool things. Like I mentioned earlier, we upload the whole app state on uh, when we get an error in the browser. So we get the user agents, so we know what kind of hardware the code was running on. And then we know exactly the state the application was in when it failed. Uh, later on, we hacked together uh, REPL-driven tests using FigWheel. Uh, and this is the part that, you know, we still get the REPL driven test using FreeWheel without any special integration with our editor. Of course, you have to type a bit more if you don't have a browser in uh, editor integration. But still, it works pretty nice. It was pretty cool. And also, since we have the whole state in a single atom, we couldn't resist but implement a full blown time traveling debugger, right? That's the first thing you do when you see your whole app state explicitly. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a quick demo of that, just because it's cool. So this is the same page earlier. Uh, but if you scroll down on that page, you'll notice that we have a bunch of uh, developers' helper tools. Like I can go directly to a given state by clicking a button. So then it will just take us through this particular state. Uh, you can interact with the form, of course.
And you can see that at the bottom of this page, the whole state is dumped in the DOM to, uh, to let you know exactly what, how we derive the view from that state. And the state contains actually here the current view with new car payment, and the form values are, okay, remember true. I mean, that's kind of nice. Um, and you can navigate all the previous slate very easily, since they're all super explicitly, you just have to keep a list of them, and then you can navigate back in time. And see every single substate, things that might go too fast in your real application to focus on, like this state here, this is a state where we are waiting for a server to respond, right? It's very nice to be able to get back to that state uh, from your tools. And of course, once you're done, you can just resume execution and keep interacting with it. Okay. So that's basically where we're at now. Um, we've been using that setup for over a year uh, in production. Uh, we feel that we've reduced overall complexity, uh, especially since we break, broke apart a big chunk of complex logic into two smaller chunks. Seems obvious, but it did, it did reduce the complexity. And we were indeed able to implement all the feature we set out to implement from the beginning, so mission accomplished. So from there on, uh, looking at the future, um, turns out that our designer want to do more than what HTML and CSS allow them to do. And turns out they're not super interested in learning ClojureScript either. Um, if you spend most of your time programming, then it makes sense to deep, deep into programming knowledge to improve your own skills towards that direction, to make you a better programmer. But if we're being honest, learning ClojureScript will not make them be better designers. This is a separate skill set. So we've been looking at some of the alternatives we have, and we're thinking maybe we can have the templates as separate JavaScript dependencies. Uh, in particular, we've been looking at using uh, React's uh, JSX template language, uh, while still keeping the whole uh, back end of the front end written in ClojureScript to control the flow and the state of the application. So we have a proof of concept ready using that with live reload and all the good stuff we have. I have a slide implemented in that later on. Uh, if I have time, I can show you. So wrapping up, I'd like to go over some of the conclusion we reached during this uh, experience. There's a few bad things. Um, ClojureScript was out of our comfort zone at the beginning, so there was a certain learning cost up front. And I'm not only talking about learning the language, but learning the ecosystem. It takes time to be aware of all the options that are available. There are not as many as in JavaScript, so in that sense it was much easier to get into ClojureScript than it would have been to get in modern JavaScript development. But still, a little cost. Also, tooling setup, like the overhead is still significant for things that are not directly ClojureScript. I mean, if you just want a ClojureScript running in production with only developers, then you get FigWheel, and that's, you get everything out of the box. Like, lane new FigWheel, you got a things that's very close to be production ready. But if you start to factor in more things, like designers and uh, extra toolings you need when your application is a bit more complex, then you have a bit more setup to, uh, to, to fix. And of course, this iPhone 4 hardware bug. I, I mentioned it earlier. I, I just want to make you aware that it exists. It has been a big time cost uh, for us. But we did find a workaround. And it might not even be relevant to you. I mean, it just turned out that some of our users, some of our important users, had a broken iPhone. Maybe you don't have that problem. Anyway, just in case you get those weird error in productions, maybe it's not your fault. All in all, um, we didn't regret any of our, uh, of our choices. Uh, we're very happy, I'm very happy with uh, 
where we are today. There was a lot of good things. First of all, it made me love front-end work, which was not a given from the beginning. Like, I was scared of doing front-end stuff. Uh, and uh, being afraid turned out to snarky remarks and, you know, dismissing, oh, there's a ton of complexity in the front-end, there's this JS fatigue, I don't want to get there. Matter of the fact is, I just didn't know how to do things. And then I got in using ClojureScript, and now I'm like, yeah, this is not, it's not that hard. There's a lot of things going on, but just choose a way, and one small step at a time, by being aware of your pain points, you will get there. Also, I really love the way we organically grew our project. Our uh, minimum viable product was all contained within a single namespace, a single file in ClojureScript, and then we just added more routes and we're like, oh, this starts to get a lot of routing going on. Maybe we just break the routing namespace into a separate file, you know? We didn't have from the beginning uh, the need to architecture our whole application. We didn't even know what we wanted to do. But using ClojureScript, it was really nice to see that, yeah, just small steps, just only add abstraction when you need them, only add structure when you need them. That's awesome. And also, at the end of the day, people got empowered, and both developers and designers, they were getting more things done faster, and it's a really great feeling. Uh, in particular, like, uh, our designers are now able to design, implement, and deploy their own A-B tests without having to touch a single line of ClojureScript or anything. They just use a bit of uh, markup in the HTML, and that's it. It's really cool. So I think that's all I have for today. So I'd like to thank you all for having me here. And in particular, I'd like to thank Lin for the logistic and organization. It was awesome. I'd like to thank uh, Michal that helped me with uh, mentoring me on those slides and gave me very good feedback. And all of my Zimpler colleagues for this awesome journey together. So thank you.